Hi, everyone. My apologies for the uh, slight delay. Uh, we faced a few technical difficulties, so I'm just going to get straight to it and just get started. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Eleanor Shioti Hughes, and I'm a first year Meja uh, graduate student um, at the SFS, and my area of expertise is primarily Japan and security and politics in the East Asia region. Um, for this semester, this is actually not my first time moderating, and I can see that some of you were actually attended the previous event that I moderated for. So thank you for joining again. And um, for those of you who are in other parts of the world that might be more late in the evening or possibly even overnight, uh, thank you for staying up late. We really appreciate it. Um, so yeah, thank you again for being here. Um, so I'm just gonna get right to it and introduce our guest speaker. Um, today, we are pr privileged to have Sean King from Park Strategies LLC based in New York. He is the senior vice president, um, which and uh, Park Strategies is also a business consulting firm. Um, last year, he became an affiliated scholar at the University of Notre Dame's Liu Institute for Asia and Asian Studies. Before joining Park Strategies, he spent five years at the Commerce Department in Washington, DC, where he was the senior advisor for Asia in the US Foreign and Commercial Service. And before that, he was based in Singapore and working for both PricewaterCoopers, otherwise known as PwC, and Citibank. Also, he also worked for the New York State Department of Economic Development, in which in 1997, he led a trade mission to Taiwan. Sean received his undergraduate from American University and then subsequently got his MBA from the University of Notre Dame. As part of his MBA, he did a summer internship for Citibank in Taipei. And interesting fact, he is also fluent in Swedish. Sure. And the reason why I'm mentioning that is because, <laughs> because I have an aunt from Sweden. Um, so yeah, and Sean, thank you so much for being with us today. My pleasure. Happy Friday. So uh, yeah, thank you for the invitation. Happy Friday the 13th. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Hopefully it's not a scary Friday the 13th. Uh, Stephanie, thanks for the invitation. And Eleanor, my good friend of many years, always great to be with you. Uh, I didn't get into Georgetown undergrad, so I've taken preparation for this pretty seriously. And for the first time in my life, I'm actually going to read prepared remarks, but sort of like President Trump at a rally, I reserve the right to go off script and ad lib as we go. And uh, anybody who knows me, you can tell it's actually me speaking, even though I'm reading. As for the title, please don't expect any kind of US policy manifesto and or special insights into the incoming Biden administration's Taiwan policy. Rather, we just needed a title around my talk when we first came up with this idea a few months ago, and this seemed as good a title as any. I'm first gonna go into some history about Taiwan, just some things that have caught my eyes and ears over the years and shape how I view the place. Many, if not most of you will already know these things, but given the opportunity, I'd like to clear up some misnomers and lazy cliches about Taiwan that I hear all too often. I'll then bring it forward to where we've been under President Trump and where we could or should go under President-elect Biden. Bear with me on some of my historical rabbit holes as they all eventually lead to some relevant point about what's happening today, or at least that's my goal. First, a little background about myself. I fell into Taiwan by accident in the mid-1990s after a long interest in Europe and also US politics, hence the 1997 trade mission to Taiwan and also my speaking Swedish from an earlier life. I don't have a classic academic background and think what I think about Taiwan from the years since of watching, reading, seeing, and doing. I still have yet to formally study any Asian subject aside from doing business in Japan, a class I took in graduate school. Others know far more about Taiwan than I do, but I'm happy to add my own observations to whatever else you may read, hear, or learn elsewhere. As usual, my thoughts are mine and mine alone. Please blame me and not my boss, former U.S. Senator Alphonse D'Amato, for anything I say here today. It's important we see Taiwan for what it is and not just as a subset of U.S.-China policy, not as a problem to be managed, as it were. Growing up in a U.S. Republican household, I came to view Taiwan as a Chinese West Germany or Chinese South Korea. In other words, the free part of China. But that's not necessarily the case, and there's more to it than that. Taiwan is its own unique situation. One thing I've noticed is late is faulty comparisons between Taiwan and Hong Kong. With the passage of Hong Kong's national security law, there have been many such comparisons between the two. But the major difference for me is that Hong Kong has been Chinese forever and ever, first incorporated into China during the Qin Dynasty, which took place between 221 and 2006 BC. 
At the time of the 1997 handover, even the most ardent Anglophile Hong Kong democracy activists would have said they're Chinese and that Hong Kong's part of China. Still, Hong Kongers had no say in their own fate, only to be handed over to Beijing by colonial power Britain. By contrast, Taiwan was settled by Austronesians, Taiwan's first inhabitants, thousands of years ago. Chinese immigrants from Fujian province only started arriving on Taiwan in the 15th century, and there were also 17th century Spanish and Dutch settlements on Taiwan. In 1661, and bear with me here, Ming Dynasty General Cheng Chung Kung, otherwise known as Koxinga, retreated to Taiwan, fleeing Manchu invaders. Koxinga expelled the Dutch taking Taiwan for himself. He was succeeded by his son and grandson. In 1683, again bear with me, Admiral Shi Long invaded Taiwan to put an end to the Cheng's independent pirate kingdom on the island. Taiwan was thereafter made a prefecture of China's Fujian province. Please note this is the first time Taiwan was ever incorporated into China, almost 1900 years after Hong Kong first became part of China. So while today Taiwanese are 98% ethnic Chinese, the island's only ever been ruled from the mainland for a grand total of 216 years and for only four years since 1895, as it was a Japanese colony from 1895 to 1945. The Nationalist Republic of China, founded on the mainland while Taiwan was under Japanese control, was given administrative control of Taiwan in 1945. This is known as Retrocession Day. Arriving mainlanders, Weishengren, were given priority and power over local ethnic Chinese, Fengshenglen, people whom we today call native Taiwanese. On February 28, 1947, a dispute over contraband cigarette sales resulted in gunfire and thousands ended up dying in a civilian massacre that is now a Taiwanese holiday. Taiwan entered its so-called white terror era and martial law was in effect until 1987. It's important to remember at this time, after the Chinese Civil War and the Republic of China seat of government retreated to Taipei in some sort of quasi-domestic exile, that Taipei saw itself not as the capital of Taiwan, which it was provincially in the Chinese sense, but as the provisional capital of all China. In other words, true nationalist China, free from the man mainland's communist bandits. Taipei, until it technically walked out before it could be kicked out, held the Chinese seat at the UN. It was never in the UN as Taiwan. Taipei and Beijing, the ROC and PRC respectively, competed not as Taiwan and China, but competed with each other to be the real China, the only China, even though ironically enough, as mentioned, Taiwan was not even under Chinese control when the ROC was founded. Interesting point, at the 1964 Tokyo Olympics, the International Olympic Committee under pressure from the PRC who it wanted to bring into the games at some date future and the socialist world forced Taipei's team to compete as Taiwan, not under its preferred moniker, the Republic of China. Ironic because in 2018, a Taiwanese ballot referendum to change its Olympic team name from Chinese to Taipei to Taiwan was deemed provocative. Well, I guess if you live long enough, everything that was once forced is now provocative. You see everything. Taipei and Beijing refused to recognize any government that recognized the other, which is just like the policy the, called the Hallstein Doctrine that West Germany had from 1955 to 1970, whereby it refused to recognize any government that recognized East Germany. Beijing still takes this approach. In 1979, the United States switched its Chinese recognition from the ROC in Taipei to the PRC in Beijing. We didn't switch, as you'll often hear, from, Taipei, from Taiwan to China. Rather, we just switched from one Chinese government to another. It's an important distinction. This was the birth of our so-called one China policy, where we chose to recognize one Chinese government, in this case, Beijing's, while merely acknowledging, but not recognizing Beijing's claim that Taiwan is part of China. For the record, at the time, Taipei II was adamant that Taiwan's part of China. They just disagreed over which China, the ROC or the PRC, and to be clear, our one China policy is not Beijing's one China principle, which states Taiwan is not only part of China, but that the PRC is the rightful government over it. Beijing seemingly willingly confuses the two at its convenience. This is despite the fact, Beijing feels this way, that neither Mao Zedong nor the PLA ever set foot on Taiwan. What's more, they could have theoretically taken Taiwan when they had the chance, but they instead bailed out 
North Korea from its failed 1950 invasion of South Korea, costing them Taiwan in the process. But that's another story for another seminar. In 1987, as mentioned, martial law was lifted. But also of monumental importance and not as much talked about, four years later in 1991, four appendages were added to the 1947 Republic of China Constitution, acknowledging that the R Republic of China's jurisdiction was limited to the areas it controls. This is what's known as the ROC Free Area or Taiwan Area. It includes Maine, Taiwan Island, and Penghu, both part of what people who consider Taiwan part of China would call Taiwan province, but also Jinmen and Matsu, part of mainland China's Fujian province, a few other minor islands, and the three South China Sea assets that Taipei occupies, namely Itu Aba, Pratas Island, and Chengchou Reef. Remember, Beijing's nine dash line in the South China Sea is based on the ROC's own 1947 11 dash line that Taipei itself still claims. Hence, Taipei's South China Sea claim, unfortunately, helps historically underpin Beijing's. However, Beijing shaved two dashes off said line in deference to communist Vietnam, which is how we got today's notorious nine dash line. Taiwan's friend should ask Taipei why it upholds its South China Sea claim. Why would a supposedly Taiwan-centric DPP regime, the ruling party, be tying itself to 1940s Chinese nationalist claims? In fact, when Manila won its 2016 South China Sea United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea ruling at The Hague, Taiwan President Tsai spoke out against it almost as forcefully as Xi Jinping did. The US State Department scolded former Taiwan President Ma Ying-jeou when he visited Ituaba in 2016. In a sense here, Taipei is helping Beijing make its own historical case by holding on to this South China Sea claim. Same goes for Japan's Saku Kakaku Islands, but I digress. Let's move on. Nobody would oppose Taipei dropping its South China Sea claims more than Beijing would, which is why I'm so surprised some people recently speculated that Beijing might try seizing Pratas Island or Itu Aba in the South China Sea, or even Jinmen or Matsu, again, both historically parts of Fujian province from Taipei. This wouldn't make any historical sense for Beijing as it would cut Taiwan's last few remaining Chinese ties. Taipei losing any of those islands would only make Taiwan less Chinese and in turn more Taiwanese, which is what I thought Beijing doesn't want. In fact, what I see as a, in what I see is a series of self-defeating moves and about which Notre Dame's Joshua Eisenman and I wrote in Foreign Policy Magazine in May, Beijing has tried to extinguish any reference to Taipei's Republic of China government the world over. But Beijing does so at its peril, as such short-sighted hard-headedness denies those on Taiwan who still identify as Chinese at all the ability to identify as such on their own terms. After all, the ROC constitution still calls for one China. Those 1991 constitutional appendages set the stage for democratization and greater localization as the government could now alter the social and political landscape within the areas it controls. In 1992, by the way, only 17% of people on or in Taiwan, depending on how you see it, identified as Taiwanese. But this May, the Pew Research Center found that 66% view themselves as Taiwanese, 28% as both Taiwanese and Chinese, while just 4% see themselves as exclusively Chinese. Taiwan's issues are thus not only with and against the mainland, but also with itself among different constituencies within its borders over longstanding post-1945 resentments, injustices, and unsettled scores. Those 1991 appendages also, in theory, opened the door to the idea of dual recognition. In other words, it being okay from Taipei's view, at least, of a government having diplomatic relations with both Taipei and Beijing. South Africa explored the possibility of maintaining its relations with Taipei while opening up to Beijing in the mid-90s, but Beijing would not stand for it. St. Lucia, in 2007, established diplomatic relations with Taipei while it still had former relations with Beijing. Beijing shortly thereafter severed ties, but then Taiwan Foreign Minister James Wong told the New York Times that Taipei never asked St. Lucia 
to sever ties with Beijing and actually went on record saying Taipei was okay with the idea of dual recognition. After winning re-election in January, Taiwan President Tsai Ing-wen told the BBC, Taiwan does not have to declare independence because her government's already independent as the Republic of China, Taiwan. I saw this as a peace offering of sorts to Beijing and a reassurance to Ta Washington that she planned to maintain the status quo in the Taiwan Strait. But of course, nothing is seemingly good enough for Beijing on Taiwan. Now, in to enter all this, four years ago, enter Donald Trump. He's still president, and I suspect he'll be filling the space in our heads regarding Taiwan and just about everything else for years to come, if not when he perhaps runs again in 2024. I, for one, never expected Trump to be good for Taiwan. He's long had a soft spot for dictators, declaring on the 2016 campaign trail that he'd have a hamburger with North Korea's Kim Jong-un, and also remembering that both he and Ivanka, his daughter, manufactured name-branded goods of theirs in mainland China. In fact, I remember the time when Trump went on Letterman and Letterman called him out for having a name, uh, necktie with his own name on it that was made in mainland China, a total hypocritical contradiction of his own spoken policies. Even President Tsai's 2016 congratulatory phone call to, Taiwan, to Trump did not mean all that much to me after the initial shock wore off as it was during the transition. Of course, that was a normal transition where the outgoing president actually acknowledges the winner, I might add. And I'm not sure Trump himself even fully comprehended the gravity of the call when he more or less rhetorically asked, why can't I talk to someone whom we sell weapons? That's true to the letter, but a statement like that betrayed Trump's own lack of familiarity with Taiwan's issues. But maybe that wasn't such a terrible thing as he could thus see Taiwan with fresh eyes. But on balance, I didn't think the call was the biggest deal, which is why I don't read into anything, as some are, the fact that President Tsai so far only treated president, tweeted President-elect Biden her congratulations on his election and not called them as she did Trump. Biden tweeted Tsai his congratulations on her January re-election, so I see this as just her returning the favor, closing the loop, as it were. Trump, two and a half months after his call with Tsai and after he was finally in office, somewhat contritely read out America's one China policy over the phone for Xi Jinping. She came to Mar-a-Lago and the US PRC Taiwan triangle seemed kind of normal for a while. Well, as normal as anything could be in the Trump era. But a few months later, a switch flipped and Trump suddenly started going all in on Taiwan and has been pretty much so ever since. What made him so? Was it Beijing's backstopping North Korea? Was it US mainland Chinese trade tensions or did true Taiwan believers in the administration start pushing the island's interests. People like Assistant Secretary of Defense for Indo-Pacific Security Affairs, Randy Shriver, or John Bolton, Mike Pompeo, who knows? We may never know. Some might say Trump's been using Taiwan as a bargaining chip against Beijing, and in his tell-all White House memoir, John Bolton says Trump likened Taiwan to the ship of, tip of a Sharpie and pointed to China writ large as the rest of the pen. Maybe, but I also remember Bolton getting a lot of basic facts and timing wrong in his recounting of Taiwan's Trump's Singapore summit with Kim Jong-un. So I'm not sure what to believe, but it's results that count. And we have to admit that whatever else we may think about this president, Taiwan has fared better under Trump than it has under just about any administration since we recognized Beijing over Taipei in 1979. I dare say US-Taiwan relations have been in a mini golden era since 2017, which is why in a pre-US election YouGov survey, Taiwan was the only one of 15 Asian and European jurisdictions polled to indicate majority public support for Trump. In fact, many Taiwanese are now openly nervous about the incoming Biden administration, not necessarily because they fear Biden, but because they had it so good under Trump and fear it could only go down. And just because Trump did it doesn't make it's bad, mean it's bad. So let's look at some of the things that went Taiwan's way during Trump's presidency. He has made available for purchase more arms, about $17 billion worth than ever thought attainable for Taiwan, including some denied the island by both Bush, W and Obama. Arm sales have become more routinized, more normalized. They're announced and made available when ready and not held for a time when the news might offend Beijing less. Trump made a point of signing, not just letting it become law, the Taiwan Travel Act, 
which encourages U.S. Taiwan reciprocal travel at all levels. Trump this year sent Health and Human Secretary, Health and Human Services Secretary Azar and Under Secretary of State Kroc to Taipei for former Taiwan President Lee's memorial service, the latter. However, it should be noted that President Obama sent EPA Administrator Gina McCarthy to Taiwan in 2014. Washington rolled out the red carpet for Tsai on her U.S. transits in Denver, Houston, New York, and L.A., seeing her speak at the Reagan Library in California and visit the Johnson Space Center in Texas, a first for a sitting Taiwanese leader. We also passed the Taiwan Taipei Act, which call, leans on other countries, the 15 remaining, to not dump Taipei for D Beijing in terms of diplomatic relations. Uh, this could be a little hypocritical because that's exactly what we did in 1979, but it's nonetheless very important as these remaining diplomatic partners of Taiwan's can push the island's case in various international bodies. And perhaps most critically, Taipei maintaining its former relations with its four diplomatic partners in Oceania, Tuvalu, Nehru, the Marshall Islands, and Palau can be instrumental in ensuring the People's Liberation Army Navy does not establish maritime berths in these countries. The wider Pacific's already an ensuing US PRC battleground for influence, and Taiwan can be our assistant in this case. Under Trump, the United States has been conducting routine sail throughs and flights over the Taiwan Strait. And of course, this week, it was publicly announced that for the first time in 40 years, US Marines are training in Taiwan. US Ambassador to the United Nations Kelly Kraft recently had a very conspicuous, and I might outdoor, at outdoor COVID safe lunch uh, with Taiwan's representative or de facto consul general in New York. And in DC, Taiwan representative meetings have been held on State Department grounds. Undersecretary Kroc has also launched a US-Taiwan economic dialogue that will meet in Washington next Friday, November 20th. And Secretary Pompeo has pushed for Taiwan to regain its World Health Assembly observer status, as have, it should be said, Australia, Japan, Sweden, and many others. There's a sense among some Taiwanese and Taiwan watchers here that Republicans are inherently stronger on Taiwan than Democrats are. But I may point out it was Nixon who betrayed Chiang Kai-shek when he went to see Mao in Beijing in 1972. And it was a Democratic Congress that passed the Taiwan Relations Act that governs our unofficial relations with Taiwan, an act for which a young Senator Joe Biden himself voted. Interestingly, the 2020 Democratic Party platform reaffirms the Taiwan Relations Act, but omits any reference to One China as it previously did. And as mentioned, former Vice President Biden tweeted President Tsai his congratulations on her reelection in January. Perhaps most importantly, Taiwan policy does not operate in a vacuum. We have 28,000 troops in South Korea and 50,000 troops in Japan. Safeguarding those alliances is essential to keeping Beijing on side in the wider region, and in particular, those US forces in Japan could be called upon in a case of a Taiwan contingency. With the President Biden in office, Washington will no longer be harassing Seoul and Tokyo over burden sharing costs, and both these alliances, critical in their own ways to Taiwan's defense, will thus be more stable. Japan in general, I think, will benefit from a Biden presidency. You know, South Korea has often had this thing called Korea passing, where the major powers discuss North Korea without consulting Seoul. But in the case of North Korea under Trump, where Trump has written off and not taken seriously Japan's own concerns about medium and short range missiles, so long as they don't imperil the, imperil the US homeland, I think there's a sense of Japan passing. Uh, I know this isn't directly germane to today's talk, but with a return of, uh, with Biden coming into the White House, I expect Japan's stock in Washington to rise and for us to take Japanese concerns more seriously in general. And people matter, speaking of Japan, and many of the president-elect's trusted advisors know all these issues as well as anyone. Kurt Campbell, for one, was Deputy Assistant Defense Secretary in the Clinton administration when, in 1996, the United States sent two aircraft carrier groups to the Taiwan Strait to defend Taiwan against PRC missiles being fired into its waters. As mentioned, four of Taiwan's remaining four diplomatic partners, Tuvalu, Nauru, the Marshall Islands, and Palau, are in Oceania. Two of them, the Marshall Islands and Palau, belong to compacts of free association with Washington, whereby we provide for their defense and offer other forms of assistance. When Taiwan President Tsai visited Palau in March 2019, U.S. Ambassador to Palau, Amy J. Hyatt, was conspicuously present at the banquet. 
And for the first time ever last year, the Marshall Islands, Palau, and another compact nation that does not recognize Taipei, the Federated States of Micronesia, visited the White House as one. The Biden administration could aggressively maintain this engagement of Oceania, not take these compacts for granted, and continually lean on the Marshall Islands and Palau not to flip on Taipei diplomatically. Climate is important to all these governments, which I know is important to the president-elect. Pacific Island states are also of particular strategic interest to Japan and offer much opportunity for alliance cooperation. In fact, since 1997, Japan has every three years hosted its Pacific Island Leaders Meeting that includes all the Pacific nation that I've mentioned here. The last such meeting was called Palm 8 and was held in Fukushima in 2018. Whether or not we can have another one in 2021, given the virus, I'm not sure. Europe, for its part, has historically been soft on issues such as these, but there are signs that Beijing's sharp elbows, political illiberalism at home, for example, Xinjiang, economic coercion, Norwegian salmon being kept out of Chinese imports for over Liu Xiaobo's Nobel Peace Prize Award in 2010, and wolf warrior diplomacy in the wake of COVID-19 are finally turning some Europeans off mainland China, which could only be good for Taiwan. Sweden is working with Taiwan on climate, and the Czech Senate president recently addressed Taiwan's legislature. Germany, it should be noted, will elect a new government next year, and the most likely coalition forecast is that of a ruling center-right CDU, Bavarian CSU, in coalition with the Greens. The Greens have somewhat counterintuitively emerged as Germany's human rights conscience, and Green Party Bundestag member Margaret Bauza is one of Taiwan's strongest European factors. In fact, she's banned from visiting mainland China. I still do hold out too much hope in general for Europe on these issues as they kind of wimp out in the end. But as a President Biden works to revitalize US alliances the world over, evolving attitudes within these refreshed relationships could provide helpful force multipliers for US support of Taiwan. Taiwan's opposition Guomingdan or KMT is also perhaps changing ever so slightly. Seen over the last 20 years as friendlier to Beijing because it at least feels a historical connection to the mainland, the KMT recently passed two resolutions in Taiwan's legislature calling on Taipei to elicit a security guarantee from Washington and to also restore formal diplomatic relations with the United States. These resolutions may have been but political stunts meant to embarrass the ruling party, but they may also nonetheless speak to old and new guard tensions within the KMT and to a potential, distance, potential distancing of itself from Beijing. Money talks. As of Wednesday, Taiwan, which has handled COVID-19 so well and benefited from companies relocating there to avoid Trump's mainland Chinese trade tariffs, is America's ninth largest trading partner year to date as of Wednesday. Taiwan has long wanted a bilateral trade agreement with us but ractopamine additive based bans on US pork and beef made the issue a non-starter. But this year, President Tsai courageously lifted Taiwan's bans on these US meats in hopes of securing a wider trade deal. However, USTR Robert Lighthizer has shown little interest in a Taiwan trade deal as he's so focused on trade relations with Beijing. Whatever the technicalities given unique Taiwan status, Biden can move forward on the Taiwan trade deal on day one. Whom he picks as USTR will thus be of great interest to anybody interested in Taiwan. Taiwan is one of the few issues that unites a very divided Congress, and a trade deal with it may be one of the few trade deals that any president can get past today. Biden doesn't necessarily have to make any bold moves on Taiwan, but to merely keep in place much of what Trump's done. Similarly, when she came into office four years ago, Taiwan President Tsai had inherited a range of cross-strait market openings put in place by her predecessor, former President Ma. These are moves that she and her party likely never would have made on their own. But inheriting these policies is a different story, an easier game, allowing her government to bank the economic gains in the process. Biden can do some of that when it comes to inheriting Taiwan's Trump's bold Taiwan moves. He can also reach out to Taiwan in areas where Taiwan excels that are a priority to him, namely LGBTQ rights, climate, and controlling the pandemic. I do want to address, while I have you, one Taiwan issue that's been in the news of late, which was also the subject of a recent, recent virtual Georgetown debate, and that is whether the United States should offer Taiwan a formal security guarantee in the event of mainland attack. 
In other words, what's been called strategic clarity. I just think people are focused on the wrong thing here because any commitment to defend Taiwan would be mere words. It's not worth anything unless it's a formal defense treaty like that which we have with Japan. And I may add yesterday in a call with Japanese Prime Minister Suga, Biden again reaffirmed that Japan Senkaku Islands fall under Article 5 of the US-Japan Defense Treaty, President Obama being the first sitting US president to do so, and Trump himself reaffirming that in 2017. But how can we have, going back to Taiwan, how can we have any kind of formal defense treaty with a government, in this case, Taipei, that we don't formally recognize? That's why, unless we are willing to revisit the idea of re-recognizing Taipei, any discussion about strategic clarity is just an intellectual exercise going nowhere. As I close, why should we even care about Taiwan? In blunt military terms, let's face it, Taiwan is vital to the defense of the first island chain and from preventing Beijing developing a blue water navy. As for technology, which is where many of today's and tomorrow's battles will be fought, Taiwan is a cutting edge market leader. It's important we keep the promise and potential of Taiwan's technology sector within the free US friendly world and out of PRC hands. Taiwan also, to be a little corny, just represents what's right. Our relationship with it started out for purely realpolitik purposes, but the island has evolved into a flourishing democracy that tackles big issues like the pandemic head on. Not only do we want to do right by Taiwan's 23 million people, but even though we don't have an obligation to defend Taipei, not standing by it in case of attack would send shivers down the spines of our friends and allies across Asia and around the world. In President Tsai, who herself no longer has to worry about re-election, President Biden will find a calm but firm, reliable partner who will not exploit for any cynical political purposes of her own whatever assistance Washington gives Taipei. Biden may not go far as far as Trump did on Taiwan in a micro sense, but I'll be happy if U.S.-Taiwan relations merely go from great to good under Biden as we reinvigorate many of our other wider regional relationships at the macro level. I remain optimistic. Thank you, and I look forward to our discussion. Thank you so much, Sean, for your very insightful remarks. I feel like I've learned a semester's worth of U.S.-Taiwan relations in just 30 minutes or maybe a little bit less than 30 minutes. So uh, before I ask just like one question, I do want to let the audience know that if you are interested in asking a question, you're more than welcome to either ask your question via chat or press the raise hand function and you can turn your camera on and we'd love to hear your um, questions. Um, so before I open the floor to the audience, though, I'm glad that you brought up the South China Sea and Taiwan as a claimant, because honestly, I myself did not know about Taiwan being a claimant until I started taking um, the Law of the Seas class that's offered by Georgetown this semester with Dr. Uh, Lin Kwok from the IISS. So my question is going forward, um, do you think um, Taiwan could somehow possibly, maybe perhaps, for example, work with ASEAN nations to somehow um, partake in more dialogue with regard to like dispute resolution or um, maybe perhaps making like peaceful negotiations with regard to the South China Sea? Well, in theory, but it's important to remember that on paper, at least, Taipei is part of the problem the South China Sea because its claim underpins Beijing's and it could not participate in the UNCLOS tribunal in 2016 because it's not part of the UN. But as part of her southbound policy, President Tsai has been reaching out to members of ASEAN uh, on this and other issues. And even though if you look at the map, the Taipei claim is actually more expensive because it's an 11 dash line than Beijing's a nine dash line. The difference is Taipei does not claim the waters between its rocks and assets and islands, which Beijing does. So, and Taipei is willing to coexist with others and has talked about a peace initiative in the South China Sea. Uh, that's what President Ma talked about. And, you know, the US I know has been pushing uh, Taiwan to drop its South China Sea claim, but there are still some deep blue nationalists on Taiwan who feel an affinity for China uh, who don't want to let it go. And also Beijing would go crazy if Taipei did because that would undercut their own claim and also suggest Taipei is moving toward independence. And even those deep green Taiwanese activists who don't want to keep the South China Sea claim for historical purposes, the fact is once you have something, you don't want to give it up without getting anything. And even the US who rhetorically doesn't want to see Taipei keep it, I guess when it comes to Pratis Island, for instance, 
if it's going to be under someone's control, better Taipei than Beijing. So I see Taipei making some nice small talk on this issue, but I don't think we're going to see actual movement. Uh, it would be political suicide for Tsai on many grounds. But I do hope that eventually Taipei can see its way to dropping its claim, because to me, so long as it maintains its South China Sea claim, it can't really be Taiwan. Great. Thank you for your answer. So we do have our first question, and I, I should have mentioned before, um, if you don't mind, it's regardless of whether you're typing in the chat or you like to um, unmute yourself and um, ask your question directly to Sean, please tell us what your affiliation is and where you are Zooming from. But meanwhile, our first question is from Andrea Wong, who is a student in international public management at Sciences Po in Paris. Wow. Thank you bonjour. for Zooming in from Paris, by the way. Must be. Wow. Yes, bonjour is correct. Um, so she liked to know, well, first of all, she did say thank you, Sean, very important the lecture. I would like to point that out. Um, she liked to ask more specifically about what role the EU could play perhaps in mediating Taiwan, China, US relations. Uh, there's really no room for mediation, just like President Reagan in 1982, when he made his six assurances, he assured Taipei that the United States would not play a mediating role between Beijing and Taipei. But what I think the EU can do and is starting to do is give Taiwan more international space. Uh, as Sweden has done, call for uh, Taiwan to be included in the World Health Assembly. Because even though it can't be in the World Health Organization, because Taiwan, Taipei did leave the UN and the WHO is a UN body, there are many non-governmental and non-national bodies who are observers at the WHA, which is the decision-making body. And Taiwan was in the WHA as an observer from 2009 to 16. So it is possible for them to return, especially given their leadership on the pandemic. But as the Czech Senate president addressed the legislature, I would encourage European countries to highlight human rights infringements in mainland China, point out what's good about Taiwan, work with them wherever possible on the pandemic, on climate, and visit at a senior level Taiwan as often as possible and welcome Taiwan officials in your governments and in your parliaments. So there's obviously EU is not going to start selling weapons to Taiwan as we do, but a lot of the other stuff around the diplomatic edges, they can take the lead from the US and do that. Great, thank you so much. I do have a follow-up question. When Taiwan was did have observer status uh, during President Ma's administration, they did have to um, label their name differently, though, correct? Not as Republic of China. Then of course. They have to add yeah, of course. To Just like in the WTO, uh, you know, or in the Olympics, they have a different nomenclature wherever they are. That's really not the issue. Uh, the fact is that Beijing does not like this Taiwan government and they didn't want them in. Great. All right, so we do have another question from Lila Sadler. Thank you so much for speaking with us today. Could you speak a little bit to the role private businesses could play in improving US-Taiwan relations? Um, she's joining from South Carolina, by the way, and she was working in the nonprofit sector. Well, my sister recently moved to South North Carolina uh, and goes to South Carolina on weekends, so good to have you. Uh, I mean, like I said, money talks, and Taiwan is, especially in the pandemic, our ninth largest trading partner and technology is increasingly centering itself there. Many major tech giants, I won't name them, but they don't wanna keep their data in mainland China for fear of censorship and government interference. So they're using Taiwan as their technology hub for Asia. Uh, it's been rated among the freest, if not the freest in Asia for journalism and reporters. So businesses should call their members of Congress and tell them how important Taiwan is to them and urge a US-Taiwan bilateral trade agreement that would lock in and expand these gains. Uh, often foreign policy follows business. So the more business we can do with Taiwan and let our representatives know Taiwan is important to us, which in the age of the China trade war and this bifurcation or splinter net, I expect to become even more important. Let people know, let your representatives know how important Taiwan is to your bottom line and they will listen. Great. I did see re recently that actually President Tsai Ing-wen did send out a tweet after Cory Gardner was defeated for his recent senator um, election campaign. Um, so my question, I guess, is um, given that we are not entirely sure if there will be a Republican majority or Democrat majority um, in the next, um, in the senators for next year, sorry, in the next year, um, do you think that that will play an influence in U.S. Taiwan relations if there is a Democratic majority? 
Not really. Uh, remember, it was a Democratic Senate that voted for the Taiwan Relations Act. And I think of Democrats like Bob Menendez from New Jersey, who are among the strongest, and Sherrod Brown from Ohio, who are among the strongest backers of Taiwan. It really is a bipartisan issue. And it was Nancy Pelosi, Speaker of the House, who went to India to pray with the Dalai Lama. So while you may have some senators like Cotton, Rubio, they may hold Biden appointees feet to the fire a little more in confirmation to explicitly declare support for Taiwan. I mean, it'd really be sort of A versus A plus. Either way, Taiwan is very popular on the Hill. Maybe rhetorically with a Republican Senate a little more, but I would lose zero sleep over a Democratic Senate as it regards U.S. Taiwan relations. Great, thank you so much. And it looks like Chris, Chris Rat Wagner has a question and he'd like to ask you directly. Thank you. Sure. I'm Chris Wagner. I'm on the faculty at SFS. And I wonder about how you <clears throat> disentangle politics and business. So Taiwan is doing a lot of business with the mainland. So this is why companies are going there. So if you politicize that business, wouldn't that maybe even undermine that strong business position of Taiwan? Uh, yes, but I think in many ways, the world at large is moving away from doing business with China. So if you look at customs receipts, U.S. imports from Vietnam are up 14% year on year in absolute terms. And that's with the pandemic. That's with a depressed U.S. customer. Uh, a lot of companies have already moved or redirected supply chains out of mainland China because of government interference, increasing costs, and the U.S. trade war. So I think business is already moving out of China into other markets like Taiwan, like Vietnam. And President Tsai saw this in her 2016 campaign ahead of time and has been actively courting uh, Southeast Asia in her new southbound policy. So yes, there will be some cost uh, to doing more business with Taiwan versus the mainland, but less cost than what we saw in the past. And as we see from the Disney fiasco over Mulan, maybe that's a cost worth paying. I do have a, um, another question. Um, I think I saw somewhere recently that um, one of Taiwan's oldest diplomatic allies, which would be the papacy, has um, aligned itself closer with Beijing. Is that of great concern to Taipei, do you know? It is long-term. Uh, you know, the Holy See's diplomatic relationship with Taipei gets a lot of ink, but I think it's far from the most strategically significant uh, because it's meant exclusively there, not for political purposes, but to protect Catholics. It's it, it, purely a spiritual endeavor. It's not like the Holy See is going to be putting up resolutions in the United Nations calling for Taiwan's international space. And also the four uh, states in Oceania who recognize Taipei militarily from a maritime point of view for both us and Taiwan, I think that's more important. But in terms of like big picture, uh, freedom of religion, freedom of speech, the Holy See is obviously high profile. I think Pope Francis is being dishonest with himself and he's trying to cut a deal with Beijing to access that. And by accepting the bishops that Beijing's, the Chinese patriotic church has appointed, he's undercutting his own underground Catholics who risk arrest for practicing their faith in real terms. So I think uh, the Pope is selling out for a deal with mainland China, but I don't think he's gonna cut diplomatic relations with Taipei soon, but eventually he or his successor will have to confront that issue. And here you have the world's largest dictatorship on earth with more journalists in jails, jail than any other country, a million Uyghurs in detention camps and crosses being taken off churches. And then you have Taiwan where I can say, you know, I play roller hockey and every night on my way to roller hockey in Taipei, I would pass a mosque, have Mormon missionaries talk to me on a bike, go to church myself, you know, there's everything in terms of freedom of religion and freedom of speech. It would be a travesty if the Holy See ever dropped Taipei for Beijing. Uh, eventually it's going that way, but not soon. But in the meantime, I do think that uh, Pope Francis is selling out his own values for a piece of the Chinese market, I'm sorry to say. 
great. Thank you so much. So next we have a question from my actual, my classmate Guang Fu in my lot of this teas class, and she's actually from Taiwan. Um, she has two questions actually. So one, do you think the Biden administration would help Taiwan join more international organizations such as returning to the WHO, for example? And secondly, could you please talk more about the views of the United States and Japan just mentioned uh, that you just mentioned on maintaining the cross street uh, relations situation? Sure. Uh, well, I'm going to give Mike Pompeo a lot of credit for speaking up for Taiwan joining the WHA. And, you know, we've always supported that, but it makes it a little harder to do when we ourselves left the WHO. And I didn't mind, you know, giving the WHO a little spanking by cutting their funding, but I thought it was self-defeating to pull out of the WHO in general. So if Biden puts the United States back in the WHO and Paris climate, and other, and just works with others, doesn't badmouth NATO or trash our alliances. Theoretically, it should be easier then to get Taiwan some space in these organizations. Whether or not he'll push it as much as Trump did, I don't know. And whether or not Beijing will bend, that's another issue. Uh, after America, Japan is Taiwan's most important partner. It was a Japanese colony, Taiwanese look very fondly on their days as part of Japan before uh, mainland nationalists arrived in 1945. And any defense of Taiwan would immediately come from US forces in Okinawa. And uh, Japan's government has definitely stepped up its relations with Taiwan in recent years. So the US-Japan triangle is essential to Taiwan's defense, especially as Japan continues its outreach in Oceania. So I consider, uh, Tokyo, Washington relations essential to Taiwan's own defense. Great, thank you so much. So we have one question from Jingjie and then I will answer, um, I will let Nathaniel ask his question because he'd like to ask it himself. Um, so Jingjie Chen um, is a student also from Sciences Po, so bonjour once again, but except in King's, in King's College though it says though as well. Um, he has a question on humanitarian rights and humanitarian action Oh, sorry, he'd like to know your opinion about how the Biden administration could still make up the absence in multilateralism, which provided China with the opportunity to exercise its influence. Um, and then second question is about your observation of, quote, soft conflicts or provocations between Taiwan and China. For instance, Chinese military jets entering Taiwan's airspace. I'm still wondering how the arms sales from the U.S. will help Taipei to defend, but also spark military escalation. Well, as far as multilateralism, I think it's clear that Biden's going to be more multilateral in nature. So he will reinvigorate some U.S. alliances and rejoin some organizations and maybe even join a few new ones. Uh, so that can only be good for U.S. Taiwan interests. Uh, yeah, I mean, Beijing now says that the median line between Taiwan and the mainland doesn't exist, although it's crossed it very often. I think the arms sales to Taiwan demonstrate to Beijing that uh, the U.S. will back Taiwan most likely in the event of a mainland attack. You know, we're not saying we definitely will, but those those sales put down a marker. It also gives Taiwan reassurance that we're there, and would also discourage them from trying to develop too many of their own weapon systems. But I think those uh, weapons are a peacekeeping mechanism, and I hope it continues under Biden going forward. Uh, was there another part of the question that I maybe have forgotten now, or did I get it? Um, I am inclined to say, think you got it, unless um, Jingjie, if you'd like to come in it, to confirm yourself, if you if you answered everything. All good. Okay. Thumbs up. I think you're all good. All right. So next we have Nathaniel, uh, my classmate, actually. So um, take it away, Nathaniel. Aloha. Ah, yes. Thank you, Sean, so much for speaking with us today. Um, I was curious um, if you had any thoughts on uh, the future of the KMT. It seems that the KMT has kind of been trending, uh, trying to shed the mantle of being pro-China recently? Do you see that trend continuing or accelerating or will they, will things kind of? Not necessarily because Johnny Chiang, the youngish chairman, his term will expire next year. Uh, and it may be the old guard comes in again. And when he took over, Beijing didn't even congratulate him because remember he was uh, talking about dropping the KMT's endorsement of the so-called 92 consensus, which is this uh, supposed mythical agreement 
that was only acknowledged in 2000 by former Ma advisor Su Chi that said the KMT and the Chinese Communist Party during informal 1992 meetings acknowledged there is one China, but that each side could have its own interpretation thereof. But again, the Taipei government that sent the KMT to those meetings at the time was not elected by the people of Taiwan. And since then, and also the Beijing CCP side has never acknowledged the one interpretation part. That's the KMT's telling of it. So Beijing has only confirmed the one China part of the 92 consensus. The KMT says it's one China with different interpretations, but Beijing has never confirmed that. And then on New Year's Day 2019, Xi Jinping in his New Year's speech to compatriots across the Taiwan Strait basically laid down the law and said it's Hong Kong's one country, two systems formula for Taiwan or else, thereby undercutting the KMT's role in the 92 consensus because it apparently no longer can, can exists if it ever did. And I may mention, so long as we're back on Hong Kong, that one country, two systems for Hong Kong was actually originally designed for Taiwan and posed to the KMT when it was the authoritarian leader of Taiwan and they rejected it. And then it was repackaged for Hong Kong. But uh, one country, two systems is originally for Taiwan. So I don't know where the KMT goes. It's really interesting those resolutions they passed in the legislature and the DPP was smart enough to vote with them. So they were unanimous, kind of calling their political bluff. But it depends on who the next KMT leader is in 2021. If it's part of the old guard, and depending on how Tsai Ing-wen fares, if she stumbles, they may smell blood. Uh, but for now, I think it's going to be very hard for the KMT to stay relevant as a Chinese nationalist party on an island where only 4% of people identify as Chinese only. So uh, we'll see where the KMT goes. But I think more localization is necessary if they want to survive. If I could ask a brief follow-up, um, unrelated, but... How do you feel um, Vice President-elect Kamala Harris would approach Taiwan slash China issues? Well, she was not a member of the Taiwan caucus, uh, but on balance as a senator, she was pretty hawkish. I've even heard her called that. She said that President Trump got punked by Kim Jong-un at the Singapore summit in 2018. She said, China steals our intellectual property, but the tariffs are not necessarily the way to go because she's from a very tech export dependent state. And she said, what we should be doing is doubling down on alliances to work against China and other threats in the region. So she, on those terms, sounds kind of center right and democratic terms. And, uh, you know, Trump never talked about Taiwan, but he ended up being great for it. So given that, and remembering that, you know, policy comes from the top of any administration, I think uh, Vice President elect. Harris on Taiwan should be pretty good. Thank you so much. Let's see. I think the next question is from Arjun Mehroto. My apologies if I pronounced your name incorrectly. Uh, thank you so much for speaking with us today. I'm a recent Georgetown grad and was curious about the role of other countries. Taiwan has been never discussed more in the Indian media and policy community, and there's increased business interest as well. Is there any likelihood of the US, India, and other countries um, that might work together with Taiwan on specific issues such as supply chain diversification? Uh, I don't know. I mean, India was a little reluctant and late to join the Quad, which is this security grouping among the United States, Australia, and Japan, and India. India has always prized its independence, uh, but also definitely fears China over the border dispute and Beijing support for Pakistan. Again, India pulled out of the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, which is a low level version of uh, bricks and mortar of our old Taipei uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership that we unfortunately pulled out of. But I know that, especially with the Dalai Lama there in India, India, Taiwan ties have been warming. I remember President Ma was actually allowed to refuel there on a trip to Africa, and that caused great consternation in Beijing. And on what's called Taiwan National Day, because it's the birthplace, birth date of the Republic of China, October 10th, even though Taiwan wasn't part of the ROC when the ROC was founded, India had big ads and big celebrations for ROC Day in India. And the Chinese embassy in New Delhi scolded them for it and it's caused a huge backlash. So I see a great receptivity and warmth in India for Taiwan. 
I just, knowing India, I don't expect any coordinated US security strategy. Uh, but again, as with EU, if they can keep welcoming Taiwanese visitors, do more trade and business, I think that'll be fine and speak volumes to the burgeoning relationship between New Delhi and Taipei. All right, thanks so much, John. Um, so next we have my other classmate, Heidi Kang. Um, she's a first year graduate student in the major department, like I said. Um, what other action should Taiwan's national security advisor commit to other than a clear cut defense treaty with the US? How should Taiwan react to the PLA constantly crossing the median line in recent months? Well, again, uh, it's not my place to advise the Taiwan government. And what I was saying on the clear cut security guarantee, there's really no point in that unless we have formal diplomatic relations. So first things first. I mean, if you got a guarantee from us that wasn't a treaty, it'd just be worth the paper it was written on. Uh, I would say Taiwan has to look at its own readiness, its own conscription levels, which are dropping, and its own readiness to fight and keep buying more US weapons and uh, keep reminding the world and reminding Beijing what it can, you know, what it's doing. But as far as like sparring or dog fights over the median, uh, I don't see that as practical, but just stay close to the US, keep working with other partners, look at conscription and make sure your own forces are ready to go. All right, and she actually has a follow-up question. What should Taiwan do if the PRC institutes a naval blockade to strangle Taiwanese trade? Well, obviously you're going to call the cavalry and hopefully there would be some sort of U.S. defense from Okinawa. But at that point, I'm not sure how much Taiwan can do. Uh, but that's even more reason to keep good relations with the U.S. and Japan, just in case that day comes. I'm not a military strategist, so I don't want to get into any grand plans. Uh, but I don't expect a mainland invasion of Taiwan anytime soon, especially so long as Taipei maintains good relations with Washington and Tokyo. All right, um, so we are approaching the 2 p.m. mark. Does, just want to ask to make sure, does anybody else have questions? Um, if not, otherwise we will end the webinar at 2 p.m. as planned. Um, I'll give it like maybe 10, 15 seconds. All right, Sean, I think that's it for all the questions. Thank you so much once again for speaking uh, for Georgetown. Um, I know it's not an in-person capacity, but one day we will definitely hopefully welcome you formally to Georgetown. Whether or not I will be a student then is um, a whole nother question, I guess. But on the other hand, thank you so much once again. All right, my pleasure. Everybody enjoy your weekends. Good to be with you.